Take a few moments to kind of get still. We like always to suggest as a starting point for an hour's experience like this that we put our house in order, that we close the desk, as it were, and turn the key in the lock of the office door. And we sort of leave things outside and let go and our concerns of our loved ones and friends and our finances and so forth. Just let it all go for a while so that we can enter into an hour of introspection, an hour of consideration of some of the deeper things of ourself and of life. And it was Jesus who said, when you pray, enter into the inner chamber and close the door. And this means that we're not praying so much in words or form or ritual, but that we realize that within ourselves, each of us has a unique and very wonderful relationship with the infinite process. We have our own oneness with the divine flow. And the great need is to let go and let this flow become obvious and vital and real in our experience. Get the feeling now that, that you are not a divine happenstance and you're not related to God as with some absentee landlord off somewhere, that you are a part of the whole. You are an eachness within the allness of God. And there is that within you which is your constant support, a support of life and of health and of ideas and of creativity and substance and guidance and peace and power, all that you may desire. There is that supportive process within you. And for a moment, just dwell in the realization that this is not something you have to earn, not something you have to demand, not something you have to use cute techniques to receive, for it is the divine will to flow forth in you as the fullness of all that you need. Jesus put it, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. For a moment now, just be still and get the feeling that you are at the center of that force, that process, and it is flowing into you and through you satisfying your longing heart, filling your life with good. And we're grateful for this consciousness and this experience. Amen. I've said often that, uh, that there really is uh, no great need for any new religions in the world. We already have enough of them. I shocked some folks uh, uh, last, uh, this last Friday when I was dedicating a new Unity Center building down in Florida, and I, and I asked the question, what do we need, and need a new church for? We already have enough. And I thought, well, that's some way to dedicate the church. But it was a case of asking the question, what, what are we here for? What is the purpose of it? If all the religious people in the world actually did something about the teachings of their religion and lived up to the principles they espoused, certainly it would be a, a different world. Um, certainly there are Abundant. There's an abundance of codes and creeds and commandments that are preached and professed by all kinds of religions and uh, little understood and practiced. So we already have much more religion than we use. It's like the case of uh, the, the farmer out west. He's, 
standing up against the the fence of his pasture and a young salesman just out of college is trying to sell him some encyclopedias. Encyclopedias about the art of farming. And so he's giving him his pitch and he's telling him all the advantages and the farmer is very accommodating. He's standing there with a piece of straw in his mouth and, and uh, just sort of patiently listening. And finally he said, uh, are you through with your story, young man? And he said, well, yes, what do you think? And the man said, uh, heck, I don't need no encyclopedia. I ain't farming half as good as I know how now. So in the same sense, uh, it's not a case of, of needing a new religion, but it's a case of breaking down some of our religious concepts and creeds and codes and getting to the heart and root and, and really trying to do something about it. Now one of the things that, uh, that is overused and underdone is uh, the Ten Commandments, and this is what we're going to give some attention to. The Ten Commandments of the Judeo-Christian Bible form the bulwark of the religion of hundreds of millions of persons throughout the world. The Ten Commandments has influenced the development of modern civil law in the Western world. But we should ask the question, how many persons really understand the Ten Commandments? How many could name them? Well, you have them in your hand now, you see. Uh, how many persons could find them in the Bible, if you had a Bible here to, to look for them? And when you found them in the Bible, do you have any idea what you'd be finding? Would you be looking for a place that says, The Ten Commandments, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10? If that's your expectation, then obviously you've never looked at them in the Bible. And that isn't the way they appear. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of the Ten Commandments has become a great cliché. The Ten Commandments in name have become a symbol of what religion should be and what people should do or not do. And the word is bandied around. People say, I live by the Ten Commandments. People should have training in the Ten Commandments. I gave my children an instruction in the Ten Commandments. And most of these people are totally dishonest because most of them have never even read them, let alone be able to quote more than two or three of them at this particular time. One thing we need to ask is, are the Ten Commandments relevant to our time? And that's kind of a shocking question. It's almost sacrilegious to some people, you know, because asking whether the Ten Commandments is relevant is like, for many people, asking if God is relevant or if gravity is re relevant. How can you question something that is? But we have to question them. Because you see, the Ten Commandments deal with certain fundamental laws that are the bulwark of, of the structure and the morality and the values of our society in the Western world, and we never use them. We just talk about them. Some people say that to prevent future water gates, we need to have more instruction in the Ten Commandments. We need to learn to live by the Ten Commandments. And I say it wouldn't help a bit, because I don't know if there's one thing that I've discovered in, in trying to get through the maze and the puzzlement of this so-called Watergate dilemma, is that the, quote, President's men were almost invariably good Christians who were reared in the traditions of the church and probably cut their teeth on the Ten Commandments, so-called. We've been taught to keep the commandments, and the problem is that we've kept them too well. If someone were to give you a gift, a little box, nice red wrappings and a, and a colorful ribbon, here's a gift for you. And you took the gift and you set it on the table and looked at it a few times a day and then put it up on the shelf and kept it and dusted it occasionally. You could say, I have kept the gift. Then what is it? Did you ever open it? What's in the box? What value is it? Do you really appreciate it? Or are you just still living in the aura that we have a beautiful box here? This is what's happened to a great deal of creedal religion. 
We keep the creeds. We keep them all right. We keep them safely tucked away. And many who talk about living by the Ten Commandments, it's like having a Bible by your bedside or a Bible on your, your table. It looks good to have it there, but do you ever open it? Do you ever read it? It may be something that, that one puts his hand on and swears I tell the truth and so forth, but beyond that, what does it involve? What, what relationship does it have with life? Well, I'm not going to get into any embarrassing question of how many persons read the Bible and how much do you know about the Bible. That isn't what we're involved in now. But we are discussing the Ten Commandments, which is something which is found in the Bible, if you know where to find it. And the point is, as I say, we've kept the commandments all too well. We've kept them in tightly wrapped, gaily beribboned packages. We adore them, we revere them, we respect them, we talk about them. Now we need to learn how to break them. And that's what this course of study is all about. We could very easily have referred to it as how to break the commandments, because that's what we're really talking about. To break them down into the fundamental essences, to really find out what, the, what they're about and relate them to our own life, our own experience. The point is, when we understand the innate ideals involved in the commandments, we realize that they're not restraining laws or prohibitions of action. This has been a misunderstanding of the real purpose of the commandments. They're not meant to be restraints. They're meant to be guidelines for an integrated life. In the higher meaning of the commandments, the, the purpose is not just to improve conduct or to change character, but actually to modify consciousness. In religion, we've given too much thought, perhaps, to, to conduct and not enough to the consciousness which is reflected in the conduct. So that one actually then is, comes to, to feel that the most important thing is to, is to conduct himself in a way that he's supposed to conduct himself. And it's like putting on a new image behind which there is the same old person. But the image becomes a facade and the conduct becomes a facade. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the problems with religion, if we want to think of it in an in a objective way, that religion has dealt too much in image-making. In other words, it's been the most important purpose of, of the church or the synagogue or the religious organization, whatever, has, has been to be seen going to services at the right church, of course, you see. And the emphasis so often is on the good reputation on moral uprightness. And all of this is good, it's fine, but it's not enough. Because this goodness and this fineness can very easily be something we put on like our Sunday go to meet and close. When you talk religion to a person on the street or on a bus or on an airplane, quite often the person, if he's serious about it, he puts on a special manner, sometimes even a special intonation of voice. And if the person leads a prayer in a public meeting, then for sure he intones, Oh, dear Lord. Now, he never talks that way, but when, he, when he's in a religious thing, why, it's, it's a whole different matter, you see. So it's a facade that we put on, and this is something we really need to seriously consider and to look at. I think that, that when churches and religious institutions simply deal with morality, and the sins of immorality, then there is a neglecting of the truth of the spiritual man and the process of growth. There is a great deal of difference between fundamental spiritual truth or religion, however you want to call it, and morality. And unfortunately, most preachers deal strictly with morality because that's, that's where the action is. It's so easy to talk about sin, so that that's what most preachers talk about. In other words, uh, all the problems and the incongruities of, li of life are easy to see, how bad people are, how sinful they are. And so then the Ten Commandments come along as symbols of the holy threat that is held up for you. You better be good or else, because these commandments, you know, will break them over your head, as it were. 
the law actually will, will cause you to, to be punished and so forth. But this is missing the whole idea. So therefore, morality, as many people use the term, is insufficient in terms of trying to solve the problems of life. We don't need more morality. We need more spirituality. The word morals, the word moral, comes from the Latin word mores. And it actually means customs or accepted rightness. Social morality is based upon the mores of the times and the times and their attitudes and their values change. For instance, back in Puritan America, it was a crime punishable by imprisonment for a man to kiss his wife on his front porch. Now that was, that was morality, morality that was set up, as it were, by institutions and by people sitting in judgment on the top of institutions and that's always happened in religions in jesus day it was a crime punishable by death for a person to as much as lift up his hand to do something on the sabbath day in jesus day and we've altered the position somewhat through the years but uh, there are certain parts of the world today where where you could at least go to jail if you did anything on the sabbath day place down here in Asbury Park, you're not allowed to drive your car on the Sabbath day, for instance, not Asbury Park, one of the surrounding towns. And uh, the point is, because the thing becomes right or wrong by the way times see it, we rarely have respectability and virtue at the same time. Because quite often respectability deals with the image that we put forth. And certainly a good religious person has always got to be respectable. But virtue deals with something much deeper, something that deals with the integrated process that's going on within the person. The religious life almost invariably has been held up as a static thing rather than a dynamic process. And the emphasis so often has been on morality, on respectability, which then, by the very meaning of the words, means doing the kind of things that have been acceptable as right. And quite often people will say, well, after all, I go to church and I, I pay my tithes and I, I really don't do any wrong, I don't harm anybody, so therefore, there's nothing wrong with me, you see. Well, obviously, this is, this is totally superficial, and it's missing the real nature of life and the real process of the universe that, in which we're involved. In other words, we need to, to try to get away from this thought of, of simply doing as much as I'm called upon to do and doing what people generally find acceptable, to become involved in a quest in which we set as our goal, Jesus thought, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. In other words, it's like playing golf. One of the things that many sportsmen find appealing about golf is that really you're not playing against anyone else, you're playing against par. And you're not really concerned what the other person shoots, you're always concerned with trying to better yourself. This is the, the Hindu adage that one should not be concerned with being superior to other persons, but with being superior to your own previous self. In other words, life is a growth process. And the only standard is the ultimate standard of perfection toward which we all must continually work, continually grow, and continually unfold. We may have all eternity to work it out, but the main thing is we've got to keep on at it. And religion, then, is not just a static thing of saying, I'm a good Christian because I go to church, or I'm a good Jew because I go to synagogue, and because I don't do anything wrong. As Thoreau used to say, it's not enough to be, to be, and I forgot what he said. Uh, <laughs> it's not enough to be good. The important thing is to be good for something, you see. In other words, life is a creative experience. 
to be good for something, to actually be creatively involved in expressing this goodness and not just the static religious life of piety, which most people find insipid anyway behind their backs. It's like the little girl said in, when she was heard praying one night and she's down on her knees in her bedroom and she said, Dear Lord, make all people good and please make all good people interesting. <laughs> I've told the story, and it's certainly apropos here, of uh, an experience I had on an airplane some time ago, a few years ago. It was a transcontinental flight, so we had a number of hours together and I'm sitting next to a man. And uh, obviously, unless one is very much engrossed in his own thoughts or reading or something, you have some conversation. So we struck up a, a relationship and talked, and uh, we just talked man to man. He talked about his business and talked about his relationships. He talked about a lot of things. He really was going. And he, uh, I think much of the time he was boasting, but he was, he was sharing a lot of very personal things. And so finally, usually I dread this question because normally I... Uh, I decide, well, maybe it's better if I just call myself a, a book salesman or something. But uh, he said, uh, and by the way, what do you do? And before I had a chance to stop myself, I said, oh, I'm a minister. A curtain came down immediately. And he got a little bit red-faced. And uh, finally he said, well, shucks, I know what you're thinking, but he says, uh, uh, heck, he says, uh, I know I'm no religious saint, but he says, I was trained to live by the Ten Commandments, and that's what I've done all my life, and I figure if one does that, he's all right. And I said, absolutely right. You live by the Ten Commandments, really live with them, understand them, apply them in your life, you'll have no problems, and nobody can ever question your, your morality or behavior or anything else. And I said, uh, the devil was sticking out. I said, <laughs> Incidentally, I don't have my Bible along. Let's talk about the Ten Commandments for a minute. Uh, maybe you can recite them for me. <laughs> well, uh, he stammered, and I said, well, surely, you know, you live by the Ten Commandments. Surely you can, you can tell me at least one or two. Well, he, he stumbled along. Finally, he remembered only two. Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> and that was kind of hard to confess, because... Um, in the sharing time previously, first of all, he'd been making a big thing out of a cute little gimmick he'd found and in beating the income tax, stealing from the government, and the other one he was talking about a couple of little affairs he'd been having on the side. So anyway, this opened up a rather interesting conversation, and uh, uh, I, I think that probably it was at that time that I really began to realize that, that we need to do something about breaking the commandments getting into a concept and an awareness of what they really are. You see, the good life is not measured by the degree to which we conform to codes of a system, no matter what they are. And every religion has them, and some of them have more than others. Not only thou shalt nots, but all sorts of customs and traditions and and uh, holy days and fast days and this sort of thing. And religions have invariably dealt with these things. And one can conform to all of these things and still have something totally lacking in his life, totally lacking in his consciousness, in his experience. So the good life then is not measured by conformity to the codes and practices and so forth, but the degree to which we know ourselves and live by what Thornton Wilder refers to as the incredible standard of excellence. And there are a lot of people that do that even outside of religion, and they are referred to as irreligious. So it makes the whole idea of religious involvement, you know, kind of a, a question of relativity. Parents quite often talk about a child who is a congenital liar. The point is, every child is born with truth in him. There are no lies in the consciousness of a little one. Everything he experiences in this sense, he learns. Now, obviously, certain children have certain tendencies and are a little more susceptible to certain things. But what we call rearing, child rearing, as some educators have confessed, is a process of corruption. More than we know. This is startling, it's shocking. 
But the point is, the child gradually comes to conform, as the parents tend to do, to certain kinds of shades of truth. Oh, Johnny, um, that man at the door is coming to collect and I don't have the money, so tell him I'm not home. Johnny learned a lesson there, a very important lesson, and he learns it in many other ways, that lies are all right if you have a good purpose, a good reason, you see, so that there is a kind of a corrupting process that goes on, and it's very difficult for a parent, I know. The parents are much more of an influence in their example than the precepts that they stand for. And quite often a parent will hold up the Bible and say, you live by this and live by the Ten Commandments, and at the same time, evidence in other ways that you find expedient means of getting around the so-called laws of the land or the laws of religion. So actually, it's not a case of, of having a great need for creed or religion in our society. And we're not going to solve anything by, by telling people to live by the Ten Commandments. We need a new emphasis on integrity, on whole people, and on the self-honesty of recognizing the need for wholeness within, dealing with the truth about life and about oneself. And integrity means wholeness. That's what the word means, soundness, being intact in terms of one consciousness and character. Integrity is the feeling of oneness with reality, with God, which leads to honesty and a high level of morality, but honesty and morality that it's not, that's not simply a facade, it's not something you do because you're afraid not to do it, but it's something that is simply the natural flow of a consciousness that is in tune with the divine process. Now while the phrase the Ten Commandments is universally used, you might be surprised to discover that among religionists throughout all of the Judeo-Christian world, and we'd have to include the Islam world too, there is no general agreement as to what constitutes the Ten Commandments. Did you know that? That there's all sorts of controversy. It is generally felt that the commandments are those outlined in the 20th chapter of Exodus, and in a kind of a curtailed form, that's the, the list of them that we have on this little form that we gave you but they appear in slightly modified form elsewhere, and it's very difficult to divide them. There's nowhere in the Bible that it divides the commandments one, two, three, four, five, six. As a matter of fact, there are several religious groups that use entirely different divisions than we've used there. Uh, for instance, the Catholic Church, those of you who may be Catholics or have been, take the first two commandments and lump them together into one. And down later in the in the series of commandments, they divide one into two. And uh, so there's a lot of confusion about the commandments. It's not all that easy, but that's not just where the confusion is. The confusion is basically in, in the way in which we have accepted the background development of the commandments. So we have this Hollywood scenario of God a la Michelangelo big bulging muscles, long white beard reaching down out of the heavens and Moses is sitting there on the mountain and he hands him this tremendous stone of commandments. These are for your people, you see. And uh, so we have this, this whole general thing of the divisiveness, the idea that the commandments are right from God, therefore even as many have accepted the idea that the Bible is right from God, most people think the Bible was handed down from the sky too. Uh, not, only, not only that, but, but many uh, religious people are not even aware of the fact that there are different translations of the Bible, and some people say that you, know, you should use the King James version of the Bible so that you can speak and pray in the language God uses, uh, forgetting, or perhaps have never been told, that the King James version of the Bible was actually a according to the, you might say, to use the Latin word, a vulgar or a vulgate process of translation, which means simply putting the Bible into the language of the man on the street. And uh, King James was a very 
far-thinking person, and he authorized a special translation be made so that everybody could read the Bible. And they took all the old manuscripts and they updated them and put them into a, to a modern idiom so that people could, could deal with it. So what was the language God spoke? Well, it certainly wasn't verbal because one would go crazy if he tried to go through all the, the translations of idiom and uh, metaphor and from one language to another through many languages and try to discover what was the language they were given in. The important thing is we come to understand that the whole Bible itself was written at different times for different reasons with different purposes involved and, and came to different people. Uh, the Bible is made up of history, it's made up of, of fiction, it's made up of poetry, it's made up of allegory, it's made up of pornography. If you want to read Song of Solomon's, you read some pornography that's about as good as anything you find around today. And, uh, and people assume this is God's word, therefore it must be true, it's in the book. And most of the people who insist on this haven't the slightest idea what the book means, but you're not supposed to know. You're just supposed to read it. When I was a youngster, I used to uh, spend some time in the summer with the children of a couple of, with a couple of children of a Baptist minister who lived next door. And uh, they'd come to stay at our place at the beach in the summer, and, uh, and every night they'd have to read their Bible, you know, and we'd be sleeping in a tent or something, get their, their flashlight and read the Bible, and, and they'd read it out loud, and they'd go through the begats and the begets and all this sort of thing, and finally I'd say, well, you know, you read all that, but what does it mean? You're not supposed to know what it means. You just read it. It's good for you. <laughs> So the important thing is that when we get to this concept of the Ten Commandments, we need to know a little bit of the background. Researchers today are trying desperately to locate Mount Sinai. Archaeologists have been searching for years trying to locate Mount Sinai. I don't know, maybe they'll find it. I doubt if they will. I suspect they're looking in the wrong place. Because I think that, that the Bible uses a special kind of illustration. And for instance, when it tells Jesus went into the mountain to pray, I suspect they were simply talking about Jesus getting into an elevated state of consciousness. And he might well have been in the desert, he might have been in the valley, he might have been on the seashore, it didn't make any difference. But he went into the mountain. Just as Jesus talks about going into the inner chamber. He's not talking about a closet or a place you go. It's, it's a it's level of consciousness. And in the Old Testament, they have all sorts of figures of speech and metaphors. They talk about the, the hills clapping their hands for joy, and they use all sorts of gigantesque expressions, such as the, uh, the um, uh, grasshoppers that, uh, that destroy whole cities and so forth. You know, there's, there's a, a tendency to exaggerate. There's a special type of figure of speech. So that I suspect that Moses, if you follow his rather colorful career, Moses was not any great shakes of a person in the beginning. As a matter of fact, he was a fiery, hot-tempered person who was very insecure. He killed a man once in, in Egypt, and uh, for this reason he ran away and spent 40 years in the wilderness, running away from things. But while in his early childhood, he, he became well aware of the fact that even though he had been raised in the lap of luxury by almost the chance of somebody finding him in the bulrushes, as you remember the story, uh, he still felt that his people needed guidance and direction. They were slaves, and they were unjustly treated, and they were in bondage. So that all through these years, he had the desire that he wanted to help his people. And he remembered that, that they were oppressed not only by uh, authoritarian rulers, but by religious rituals, and there were, there were gods of every kind, shape, and form, some of them absolutely grotesque on every street corner and so forth. So his people had a deep need for an awareness of themselves as spiritual beings. So during this time he was in the wilderness. He's wandering about. He's, he's actually uh, serving as a, sh a sheep herder for, uh, for his father-in-law and spent a lot of time by himself. But while he's there out in the wilderness, he had a very great experience of cosmic consciousness. And this again is told symbolically. This is the experience of the burning bush where he sees this, this bush burning and he suddenly says, I, I must turn aside and see this thing, why it's not consumed. And then suddenly there's this awareness within himself, don't go nearer, take the shoes off your feet for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. And he had this tremendous realization suddenly of his own relationship to the infinite process. He began to realize that the burning bush was not out there. 
And it was not in religious leaders and not in churches and synagogues and so forth that the burning bush, the fire of God, came right out of the heart of man. He was the burning bush. Every person was the burning bush. So he had his own unique relationship with this process. Suddenly, he felt a sense of freedom from the old concept of the personality or personalities of God or the gods. Suddenly, he began to realize a process and a principle. And so he determined that with this he would go back and he'd help his people. But he was still a very backward kind of a person at heart, slow of speech, perhaps had an impediment, I don't know. And uh, so he said, how can I do this? Who am I? What can I do it? And suddenly there was again this inner flash that said, I am that I am hath sent thee. Go back and tell the people, I am hath sent me. And I will be your hand and I will guide you. So he was on fire with this realization. Well, it's a long story. We don't want to get into the whole thing. But you, you remember it, I'm sure. He went back and eventually persuaded the Pharaoh to let the people go. And they went out and crossed the Red Sea and all these very miraculous things. Took them out into the wilderness. And some say he was a very poor leader because he wasn't able to lead the people into the promised land immediately. And he spent 40 years, people say, in trying to find the place. You could, you could take a Model T Ford and drive from Egypt today to, uh, to Palestine in, in most a couple of days. And you could fly a jet plane, perhaps in less than an hour. It took him 40 years. Well, he wasn't trying to find Palestine. If you read the story carefully, he found it almost immediately. But they discovered that the people were not ready to go into it because they didn't have the right consciousness. So being the good leader he was, he had them settle in the wilderness or at least live a kind of a nomadic existence in the wilderness during which time they would grow. They would develop. And so he had this great guidance to help these people to make the transition from the personality of God or the gods to the process and the principle. And so instead of giving them as all religious leaders had done before, a new idol, or a new statue, or a new visual symbol of a god, he gave them a code for behavior. This was the Ten Commandments. Now Moses had this flash of insight, this cosmic awareness on the mountain. He didn't just dream these things up, and they weren't original. Actually, the, the basic essences of the, of the value structure of the, of the Ten Commandments you can find in some of the old codes of behavior and some of the old cultures. There was nothing new about it. Some from Babylon, some from Egypt, some from other traditions. But in his insight and in his consciousness, he found a way to bring to these people something that would help them. And in addition to the Ten Commandments, there was all sorts of codes for behavior, which many of you who are raised in Judaism know well, all the way from the kind of food you eat to how long you keep it and the whole bit. All of these were things for the people at that stage of consciousness, people who had just come out of slavery, people that had no sense of belonging, no sense of cohesiveness, no sense of individuality or dignity as a person, no awareness of, of, of oneness with the universe, with any kind of a religious structure. So all of this Moses undertook to give them. And the whole thing was kind of symbolized in the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments were then written on stone. Now this is important to understand too. It's, it's interesting in passing, but it's kind of an important thing because we may say, well, after all, they were given by God on stone. But you must remember that in those days they didn't have parchment or papyrus as we have today, and any kind of a legal document was always engraved on stone or scratched on clay tablets with a, with a piece of wood. So that Moses simply created a kind of a document which he passed along to the people using the, the media of communication that was, that was practical at that particular time in those places. But what he gave in these Ten Commandments was a code that had many levels. Mind you, these were, these were unsophisticated people. And it's like dealing with a parent dealing with children. You don't want the child to run off from home and, and injure himself or run away and get lost or whatever. And so the first thing you do when you have a little one that begins to move around, you put him in a playpen. And then you put him in the backyard with a fence around it. And then you begin to teach him that he must not step off the curb on that particular block. Don't you do it. So in the beginning, as soon as the person can understand you, you deal with him in terms of, of restrictive laws. You don't do this, you can't do that. But 
no one of us would ever have matured even to the level that we have unless somewhere along the line, as Paul says, there had been an effort to put away childish things, the restrictive laws of life, so that ultimately we're on our own. Then we understand the problems of traffic and we learn how to flow with the traffic, ride in the traffic, get buses in the traffic, and cross the street against the traffic. And we learn and develop new insights. Unfortunately, you see, though this is a natural sociological process of growth with people, in religion we've never been treated in that way. We still live by the commandments, by the creeds, by the ritual. This is what you live on. You don't understand them, you accept them, and they're held over your head as holy threats. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. And there are those people that say those commandments cover all that is necessary in life. Perhaps they do, but not in their present form. Not unless they're broken down to where you get to understand something about the real laws of life. It's like saying you teach people about gravity by telling them don't step off a, 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 a platform. Well, if we'd, if we'd been totally restricted by the law of gravity, and it had always been a don't, 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 we never would have learned to fly. You see, it was only when we could break down the process of gravity and understand the whole, the whole uh, physical law involved and correlate it with other laws that we were able to develop spacecraft and fly to the moon and everything else, you see. And so we must break down these commandments and get to the underlying spiritual structure that's involved. And this, of course, takes a good bit of doing. Um, the Old Testament is a story of the continuous search for God. And uh, it takes, obviously, strange forms. And, uh, and the Old Testament uh, is, is very complicated in structure. And I never suggest to a person that if he wants to get started in religion that he'd start off reading the Bible from kiver to kiver because he'll wind up being totally confused. The Bible has no consistent message at the surface. Underneath it, metaphysically, it has the evidence of a thread which I call the ascending urge of man. That's something which enables the individual to see himself, and so he must put himself into the story. The Bible is your story. And so Moses was a state of consciousness in you. The Egyptians were a consciousness in you. The Israelites were a state of consciousness in you. All have relevance. All have a proper place. And then the Ten Commandments, you see, become vessels in which there is included great processes, great fundamental spiritual laws that can help us to know ourselves. Now, let's take a look at, at uh, the first of these commandments just briefly. Now, first of all, let's, let's realize that if the commandments were truly commands, and that was their intent, they would imply a divine dictator of the skies. And that's the kind of picture that many of us have been given. In other words, this is what you must do simply because I say you must do it, I am the, the ruler, you're the peons, and I command you to do it. That's the way the commandments have been suggested. But the commandments represent fundamental spiritual laws that Moses, in his understanding, at the level of his understanding, was commending to the people. He was commending these processes to them. Even as a parent will commend a child to certain fundamental ways of life. Now, in the beginning, when the child is, is not old enough to understand anything else, you may have to command him. Because, after all, he, he cannot follow his own uh, intelligence because it's not developed yet. But gradually, the commandment must give way to a commandment, which is not coercive, which is not a force, not a dictatorial thing at all. It's a fundamental process. And ultimately, the commandment must be cemented by a commitment. And we'll deal with that as we go along, but this is a very important thing. The three C's, a commandment, and a commendment, and a commitment. Now, it's rather interesting. If you, if you look the word commandment or command up in any kind of an etymological dictionary, you'll find that the word command comes from the intense form of the word commendare the Latin word commendare, not commandare, that's another word, but commendare, which means to entrust to. So there is a process of growth involved in our lives, and this is inherent in the structure of the Ten Commandments, so that the fundamental divine laws are essentially supportive, not restrictive. 
There's nothing in the nature of the universe or in the nature of God that could be restrictive of man. And we miss the whole idea if we deal with a restrictive code of behavior. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. Because if the universe says anything, it says, I am. It says, yes. God always says yes, as the song sings. Never know. God always says yes, you see. It is man's consciousness that builds up the no's and the limitations and the can'ts and so forth. There's nothing restrictive in the universal law. It's all supportive. That's why Jesus says, know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Know the metaphysical law and be free from the restrictive aspect of the law. In other words, the commandment is a commandment to a deeper spiritual process to which the person must make his own personal commitment. Um... Sin has been the great preoccupation of religion. Sin is the great subject that preachers like to deal with. Sin and immorality. And the commandments are the holy threat. So they talk about committing sin. Committing sins against God and so forth. Well, the only sin that you can commit against God, strangely enough, is to frustrate the flow of God. And that's so-called unforgivable sin. Unforgivable because uh, you're the one that's frustrating it. And God can do no more for you than he can do through you. So if you frustrate the flow of God, a closed mind, uh, prejudice, any kind of negative attitude that you insist upon frustrates the flow of God. And that's the sin. Sin is basically frustration. A frustration of potentiality, you see. So the need is to let go, to find a method of repent, turn about, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, get into the flow of the divine process, so that you can be free. Um, and this is something, this is the spirit of the commandments, you see, that we commit ourselves to a conscious acceptance of the flow of the infinite process. Now you find that in mind, and you go to the 37th Psalm, for instance, and it says, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust in him, and he will bring it to pass. Or in Proverbs you read, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy purposes shall be established. Now this essentially is what the commandments are all about, but what they hardly ever are used to deal with. Because they're always used as restrictive laws. Don't do this, don't do that, you can't kill, you can't steal, you can't commit adultery, and all these things. Whereas it's saying you can't, but people do them anyway. And then they feel guilty, or they do them in private and don't do them in public, and this sort of thing, and try to find ways to get around them like we do getting around loopholes in the income tax law and feel that I'm still pious because after all I go to church and I got the Father's holy blessing and that makes it all right, you see. But we've, we've assumed then that life is simply a, a, a matter of, of getting the right performance, letting God believe that we're really holy and saintly and so forth, where in inner side we're, we're kind of pulling some strings behind the scene. And who do we kid? Because life is consciousness. So actually the commandments are intended to be processes to which we commit ourselves. And so the first commandment is, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. Now this would sound as if it were the divine dictator saying, look, son, I'm the boss around here, don't you play into anybody else's hands, I'm in control. That's the way we've, we've, we've been taught the commandment is saying, that isn't what it's all about at all. I am the Lord your God, it begins with the I am, because... This is where all life begins. This is, this is the, the, the thing that started Moses off in the first place. Remember when, when he said, But who shall I tell these people sent me? And, and the voice within said, Say unto the people, I am that I am hath sent thee. The I am is man's unique individualization of the infinite process. It's the spirit in you. It's the ultimate being in the process of being you. This I am is, is given a lot of attention in metaphysics and in all sorts of esoteric religion. But it's a very important thing. We'll be dealing with it more as we go along because one of the other commandments uh, deals with it to a great extent. But I am is the Lord. You see? Not God up there saying, I'm the Lord and you better believe it. But the Lord refers to the law, the law of your being. I am is the law of your being. I am. This is the focal point. This is the point of your nature where the allness of God manifests in terms of the eachness at the point where you are. I am is the Lord your God. 
the law of your being, and you shall have no other gods before me. In other words, that you shall not make all sorts of graven images, as we'll deal with in another commandment, that you will not get involved in worshiping idols, and idolatry is one of the great problems in life, and any kind of frustration of the potentiality of the spirit within the individual is a kind of idolatry because it means that instead of keeping in the flow of your own spiritual nature acting upon your own innate oneness with the universe and living in an integrated sense as the person that you really are you make a god out of fashions and styles and customs and, and uh, people that tell you this and they say that and all of these things pull you this way and that way and you get totally out of the flow of your own innate nature. And this is the great sin. This is the cause of all the behavioral problems, all the difficulties, national, international, personal, or no matter what that man experiences because he gets out of the flow of the integrity of his own person as an integral part of the universe. Religion innately, back in the early uh, derivation of the word, the word religion means religio, to bind together. Religion basically was intended to be a means, a process by which the individual could integrate himself into the flow of his own being. Unfortunately, religion hasn't taught that very much because it's become institutional and it's become authoritarian and it's become autocratic and it's wagged the finger. The religion has played the role of God. You cannot do this and you cannot do that and we have the commandments to prove it, you see. And so we missed the whole idea. The real process of the individual, the worship of the person and the need to integrate the person in the flow of the divine process. So we've, we have all these cliches such as I believe in God the Father, I believe in this and I believe in that. And we believe we believe when we say we believe and it makes us feel very good. Do you believe in God? Someone once said, I know what I believe by how I found my, find myself acting. That's the only way you can know what you believe. If you really believe in God, then you will act as if this divine process were the real source, the real resource in your life. If you really believe in God, then you would know that God is the source of substance, and you wouldn't have all the qualms and fears and shaky feelings when you see the fluctuation of economic conditions. If you really believe in God as the allness and the one presence and the one power, God is the source of life, then you wouldn't be as involved in or concerned about the physical aspects of life and where you can get the right remedy and who can do this and that and the other. If you really believed in your relationship with the infinite process, the belief that, that, that God is actually a mind activity that, that is constantly flowing into the person in terms of guidance as a principle, then certainly you wouldn't be looking in the horoscope every day or getting a life reading or asking what they say or he says and this person says in order to make decisions in life. You would know that you have your own unique relationship because the ground on which you stand is holy ground and you are the burning bush. You are the fire of the activity of spirit. Now obviously that's going a long way and, and most of us have a long way to go to understand that and to experience it. But that's what's meant by I believe in God. So actually the, the average person who says I believe in God, what he really means is I want to believe. There was one honest man who came to Jesus. He said, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. In other words, I want to believe. I think this is great. I think this is a great structure. I can see in, in with my intellect how it makes a lot of sense, but I've got an awful lot of unbelief in consciousness. And we might as well face it, you see. This is where we are. Life is, is not casual, it's causal. And when we lean on things and people for support, then we lay hold of life on the level of incompletion. Life in a capricious sense which sets the keynote of everything that life does to us. If we see this relationship with God as a kind of a static, limited sort of a thing, then we're going to be constantly surrounded by static, limited conditions. Now, just, just very briefly, as we bring this to a close, the first commandment really begins with this idea of, of in the beginning God. 
in the beginning there is only God. This is the, uh, the central prayer of Judaism, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. If we really believed that, if every Jew really believed that, and if every Christian really believed that, because it's fundamental in the, in the Judeo-Christian structure, if we really believed that, we have no other problems. The Lord our God is one, that there's only God. There's only one divine, orderly process in the universe, and I am an expression of it. Because you see, if there is a principle, a fundamental mathematical principle, that, that, that one plus one equals two, how then can there be a contrasting force that tempts us to get three? And that's the way we've been taught the religious structure, because we've been taught that you should worship God but stay out of the way of the devil. Well, how did he get into the act? The Lord God is one. The doctrine of evil as a power, or Satan as the prince of evil and so forth, is a blight on religion. This is the great problem in trying to get any sort of sense out of religion as a flowing experience. This two-power philosophy has evolved out of man's ignorance and his inability to understand and to justify human experience in the flow of a divine process. Without any awareness of this first commandment, the allness of God, we find ourselves asking questions like, how could God allow this to happen? How does such a good religious person have this painful situation and so forth? Well, the very fact that we ask the question indicates that we've never really understood the process. We're still hung up on the God out there, the man with the white beard and the long flowing muscles who's sitting off there on a cloud somewhere. And we may uh, lovingly say that he's so busy with other affairs he doesn't have a chance to help me, but probably silently and secretly we find ourselves saying, look, if you don't get on the job, I'll find me a better God. And many people actually, subtly, psychologically, change religions for this reason. Because they feel they're going to get a new God. They're going to subscribe to a whole new divine process. Because God hasn't treated them too well. And after all, I was a good Catholic or a good Methodist or a good truth student or whatever, and it isn't working, so how could God allow this to happen? How can I have faith in him anymore? So you turn in your membership and you join another one. Subscribe to a new magazine, in other words, you see. But the point is, the Lord God is one. And the, the, the thing is, if we understand this, that we, we get to the basic Pythagorean proposition, which is fundamental in all mathematics and physics, that all numbers proceed from, from a unity, from oneness, and a resolvable back into that unity. Everything begins with one. You can take one and make it two, three, six, nine, a million, trillion, and so forth, but it's all resolvable back into one, and that's the only reason we can solve mathematical equations and problems. And the point is, we can duplicate that one into manifold situations and create complicated problems, but at the root of it all is always one. Here, O Israel, the Lord God is one. That's the reason why we can say it's possible to, to overcome this thing. It's possible to do all things. It's possible to be healed because the Lord God is one. Because all the manifold, complicated equations and problems that come in life are resolvable back into the basic one. And so this is why the commandment begins on this level, you see. That, that I am the Lord God, and there shall have no other gods before me. I am one, fundamental, oneness, unity, wholeness, completeness, the allness. And any other thought or feeling or relationship that you have in consciousness is a sin from the standpoint that it's blocking the flow. It's obstructing this realization. It's like taking one out of your, your mathematical vocabulary, as it were. You no longer have a one. Now you're playing around with all sorts of problems, but you can't answer any of them because you've lost the knowledge of the one. That's where man is, basically. And we get back to this one. And if we understand this, then we take the first key along the way to breaking the commandments down and making them real, vital processes in human experience and unfoldment. And we'll move along next week into another of the commandments until we cover them all. I might just say that we're going to take a few moments following our meeting tonight for those who can stay for, uh, for a sort of a feedback session. But first of all, let's, let's take a few moments to bless and consecrate our gifts. One of the things that happens as we become aware of fundamental divine law 
is we see that it has many facets. Out of the one comes the many, and the many is always resolvable back into the one. So we find many seeming fundamental laws. Jesus stresses the law of giving. As you give, so shall you receive. And all this really means is that if we get the awareness of life as a flow, life as a giving process, then we keep ourselves consciously in tune to that I am the Lord God, and thou shalt have no other gods before me, which means then that we think give instead of receive. We think expression. We think unfoldment. And in this consciousness, we see the symbolic gesture of giving such as we do right now is a very, very important, significant thing, but always based upon the one, the whole, I am. So now let's know that though you may take an evidence of some material substance in your hand, we know that it symbolizes something of the allness of substance which is everywhere and limitless. But you take it in your hand and for a moment you get the idea of the one at the root. One substance, one mind, one process. And so therefore for a moment you think it's not I but the Father. I'm not giving this. I'm in the flow of it. And the giving is as spontaneous as water coming out of a faucet. The faucet doesn't give the water. The faucet simply receives the water and becomes a channel for it. So you do not really give this thing. You become a part of a flow. And this is a beautiful thing. Because in this one instant of awareness, resolving it back into the one, one substance, one mind, one creative process, then you're in the flow of that which can multiply and increase and bless and enrich you in ways beyond imagination. Marvelous things can happen to you right now if you just get this idea of the one. So that's what we have in mind when we say divine love through me, flowing through me, blesses and increases all that I give and all that I receive. Now let's know that together. Divine love flowing through me blesses and increases all that I give.